So good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Joanna Kerr. I'm a librarian with the London Public Library. Thank you for joining us for this fourth event in our Environmentalist in Residence series with Jennifer Chestnut. A warm welcome to Jennifer and to Penn Kemp who we'll meet very soon, hello. A quick note that live transcript is available for this program if you'd like to see closed captions. Uh, to enable them, you can click on the box in your Zoom screen that has the letter CC on it. Uh, there are limitations to this service. It's affected by volume and background and it only does English words, but um, we'll have full captions available uh, when we record this program and have it posted to our YouTube channel for the library. So I'd like to start today by acknowledging um, that for myself as a second generation European settler whose paternal ancestors have made their home on the lands of the Acadia First Nation, and as a third generation European settler whose maternal ancestors made their home on the lands of the Ardoch Algonquin First Nation, that the territory I'm speaking to you from today is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, as well as the Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, Lenape Walk, and Adewanderon peoples. The Crown Treaties in this territory are known as the Upper Canada Land Surrenders. These treaties continue to be living treaties. The Indigenous communities in this region include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. Uh, we invite you to read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and to reflect on acts of allyship with and action to support Indigenous communities. The link to these calls to action is, will be shared in the chat. Acts to raise awareness and take personal action could also include reading books by Indigenous authors, a selection of which will be included in the follow-up email after this program, or by connecting with local Indigenous serving organizations. Thank you for reflecting on this acknowledgement. So today, Jennifer and Penn will share uh, readings and invitations to share your thoughts after we finish our formal program uh, and recording at 2.30. Uh, Jennifer is able to stay on um, to chat in person. It is our intention today to offer a welcoming and inclusive environment for everyone. Please reflect on this as you share your thoughts and questions. And a big thank you to our partners. This program would not be possible without the support of the Houston Family Foundation. And we thank the City of London for their ongoing support and partnership in this program. So let's start with introducing Jennifer, our environmentalist in residence. Jennifer is an environmental educator and activist. She is currently studying emotional responses to uh, environmental challenges as part of a master's program in education and sustainability, creativity, and innovation. She is a facilitator in the work that reconnects a peer-led group process that supports moving through eco-despair to empowerment. A very warm welcome to Jennifer. And now I'll introduce our special guest for today, Penn Kemp, poet, performer, and playwright. Penn Kemp has been celebrated as a trailblazer since her first publication of poetry by Coach House, 1972. She has participated in Canadian culture life for over 50 years, writing, editing, and publishing poetry and plays, as well as giving poetry workshops worldwide. She has published 30 books of poetry, prose and drama, and multimedia galore, much of which is devoted to eco-poetry. Recent collections are A Near Memoir, New Poems, uh, and P.S. A Chat Book of Poetry. I'll add this to the link so you can take a look. So a very warm welcome to you. Uh, so looking forward to today's program, and I'll hand it over to Jennifer. Thank you, Joanna. Welcome everybody, uh, great to be with you, uh, if not in space, but in heart. Um, I am excited for today and I'm just opening up to our first poem. But my screen is disobeying a little bit. So let me tell you a little bit about today. Um, as uh, Joanna shared, uh, Penn and I will be in conversation around eco-poetry and uh, we'll be bringing forth, I'll be bringing forth in the introduction, poems that can support us and bring us, uh, you know, the magic of life, the things that we treasure like gratitude and wonder. Um, and then Penn and I will be having a conversation about how poetry is a great tool for these times that we're living in, how poetry can, uh, support us both as an individual, a citizen, but also society. So I'm going to reshare my screen because my uh, slide deck was being a little bit funny. So send a little bit of magic over to my slide 
my slide showing. Here we go. Yeah, Penn. Penn's doing it too. Welcome. Also, I see some people uh, as cameras open. If you feel comfortable, by all means, you can open your camera. If not, you want to be cozy without it, that's fine too. Okay, so sharing screen again. And Odd. Oh, there we go. Okay. Wonder. There's magic around us imbuing our eyes. There's beauty across this planet flowing through the skies. There are milk seeds blowing, soft and whimsy puffs, delicate, deliberate flowers opening, and honeybees spreading their love. They're hoping we'll notice the wonder. Stop and wonder about wonder. So one of the reasons why poetry is a, a cherished art for me is because it has really connected me to the world of wonder, uh, especially the world of wonder with um, plant, animal, mineral, ecosystem life. Poetry can also be a force to bring in gratitude and to help us like see, you know, the great intelligence of the living world and the beauty of the living world. And it's certainly done that for me. Uh, and Alice Walker was one of the first poets who helped me see that. So from Alice Walker, the American contemporary poet, we have a beautiful mother. We have a beautiful mother, her hills, our buffaloes, her buffaloes, hills. We have a beautiful mother, her oceans, our wombs, her wombs, oceans. We have a beautiful mother, her teeth, the white stones at the edge of the water. The summer grasses, her plentiful hair. We have a beautiful mother, her green lap immense, her brown embrace eternal, her blue body, everything we know. So during this uh, slide presentation in the back of our dialogue today around poetry, sometimes I'll put up an, ex an excerpt from a poem, sometimes I'll put up the whole thing and the dots are just there to kind of guide us if it's an excerpt. Um, yeah, Alice Walker, American poet, um, you might know her from her novels like The Temple of My Familiar and The Color Purple. But yeah, gratitude is also you know, a really important um, strength that we have as the human species that we can connect into gratitude uh, at any time just by putting our attention there. And we all have different ways that we might uh, help ourselves feel grateful or automatically go into gratitude. And um, yeah, so I invite us to remember that that's a strength for these times as we look out into the world with its challenges, the world outside, does impact our inner world at different times. And so gratitude is definitely a force. I kind of think of it like a, a, a poetic attitude because when we're in gratitude, if we really like um, amplify our sense of gratitude in that state, it's, you know, it's not compatible with fear or anger or some of the other feelings we might feel in the ups and downs of pandemic life. So. Thank you to Alice Walker in teaching us gratitude for our beautiful home. And in this, uh, in this uh, slideshow today, there's a little bit of referencing of, of Mother Earth. And of course, you know, the Earth is, is beyond human understanding and capacity. But, you know, the, in poetry and many traditions, uh, she's been called Mother Earth. So that's a metaphor that maybe helps us get closer to understanding the great uh, intelligence and generosity of our home, the body of the earth. A third last poem I'd like to share in this setting the stage of our time together today is uh, by Mary Oliver. You might be familiar with this poem, Wild Geese. Mary Oliver is the most read uh, American poet or most read poet actually in America. So I assume probably 
her work is the most read in North America. And of course she passed away a few winters ago, but she's helped many of us uh, redefine our relationship with nature, get closer to other species and ecosystems. Um, you know, for me, I kind of think like through the last couple decades, she's helped curate my experience with nature and, and, and tuning into her many, many books um, and words help me see things and help me connect and feel that I couldn't before. And this was the first poem that was shared with me when I was a young person. Uh, someone leaned over in a cafe and whispered this poem in my ear. And I feel like in my life, there's like a time before wild geese poem and a time after. And so this poem really awakened me. And um, yeah, so maybe I'll share the poem and see uh, how it lands on you. Wild geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. And meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clear blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. It calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. The wild geese. So I wonder if you have a favorite poet or a favorite poem that calls to you. Uh, that's nourished you in some way, maybe brought you a sense of, of wonder or gratitude. Or for me, the wild geese really brought healing for me, uh, reminding me and like actually introducing me to this idea, like outside of typical Western, very modern day thinking that, you know, we're disconnected from nature. So this, I would say for me, the, the force of this poem and much of Mary Oliver's work has been very healing for me, inviting me to this idea that I'm, I'm part of this, this family of beings. So if you, if you are a poetry lover, you just have a poem or a blessing or something or a specific poet that, um, that you really enjoy and heartens you, feel welcome to share it in the chat with the group. I do want to add just a, a tiny little thread to uh, Joanna's um, recognizing acknowledgement of whose original land or who held who held these territories and and uh, has been a guardian over our watershed, the, the place we call home, the place that connects us all, the river bringing life, and the Great Lakes uh, watershed, and particularly our our space in the watershed, which is the Thames River watershed. And I, I just want to acknowledge also that, um, you know, we share our, our living home with so many uh, fascinating and beautiful and weird, wonderful beings uh, that in the busiest, busiest of our lives and, and maybe even in the threats that we see to the environment, we, we forgot that they are coping with us. And, and uh, as uh, Dan Smoke has taught um, many Londoners from his tradition, you know, and I've heard many times through him in organizing, um, the river is still following her instructions. You know, the, the geese are still following their instructions in migration. Um, the spiny soft shelled turtles are following their instructions, you know, they're, they're doing their thing and we as humans and as species can do our thing, follow our instructions to honor life. Um, and um, yeah, I think just remembering that 
we're not alone. We're with all these species. And uh, we're in a beautiful area. It's kind of actually amazing to stop and think how biodiverse our area is. Um, our watershed, we're in one of the most biodiverse regions in Ontario. So thank you to our river and all of the life that the river supports. Yeah, about this gratitude thing, um, I was sharing that uh, and you might have different uh, gratitude traditions. Let's go into gratitude in a moment. I want to just say a couple words and maybe invite us into a little gratitude. I'm just checking back at the chat and I just want to acknowledge that Linda was sharing that she loves Emily Dickinson. We grow accustomed to the dark. And uh, you're in for a treat today. Penn's going to share um, one of her poems that uh, is, you know, is really inspired by Dickinson. And we'll, we'll hear a little bit of her poems today. So thank you so much for sharing that. About gratitude, um, yeah, so for me, you know, one of the gratitudes I have for living here, I live down near the forks, is the Great Blue Heron, and uh, when I'm out at the river, and I try to get out at the river most days, you know, I just have one, like, one eye kind of peering to see if the heron's going to come, or um, in the summertime, the spiny soft shell turtles, or the many beings. And, and as I said, poetry can be a force for that. Whether it's, you know, long extended poems or just like snippets of poems that help us connect with gratitude. So yeah, back to you. What are, what are some species that you feel grateful for? Uh, in our in our watershed, like who kind of catches your attention, or who do you have a relationship with, or who makes you smile? Could be plants, could be uh, in the animal kingdom, uh, vertebrates, animals, invertebrates, insects. Like who who kind of catches your attention? Let's pour out some gratitude for uh, the other beings that are probably just outside our door, actually. I know the gray squirrel I often see and is probably chitter chattering and up to some interesting business. So who are you grateful for? Please, let's put that into the chat. We'll take a minute to do that. Yeah, and thank you for your Walt Whitman quotes. Let me go back and see that. I just scanned that. Leaves of grass, beautiful. Next one. Ah, oh, yes, the red winged blackbirds and deer and all the diverse birds. It's such an exciting time right now with the birds, right? The migrations, the returning, the songbirds. I know Joanna's going to make an announcement about an awesome birding event coming up very soon at the end of our time together today. Canada geese from Jesse and squirrel. Awesome. Uh, from Patrick, the raccoons. I know strange, but I had a specific mid-pandemic encounter that was quite enlightening. Cool, Patrick. I'm very curious. So there are raccoons. I know sometimes we like, we don't kind of uh, even think of some of these species that maybe are sometimes even a bit disregarded like the raccoons or the skunk but they're quite they have their own flair for sure and that awesome mask of the raccoon the red-tailed hawks great thank you and uh, maybe another 30 seconds anybody else wants to share some gratitude we'll continue to dive into this topic owls thank you Oh, Richard says sparrows with their busy ordinary chatter just outside my window. Nice. Maybe some other of us love the sparrow. Feel that? Yeah, we share gratitude. It also connects us, right? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, feeling empowered by that. It's gratitude, a force does. All right, what else about poetry? Why is poetry? a force for these times. Okay, I just want to give you a tiny bit more description of what we're doing today, and then we'll go into specifically why poetry is so um, appropriate for 
these times as an art, any art really. I mean, the arts are uh, a great way to communicate some of the, our deep values and uh, communicate tough things as well. Uh, Penn and I, uh, Penn is obviously a multi, multi-decade um, professional poet and I have a deep love of poetry and, uh, and practice some poetry myself. So we're gonna share on poetry today. Um, yeah, and we'll be seeing uh, a few more poems from the broader eco-poetry tradition. The eco-poetry tradition goes back far, probably as far as the beginning and the roots of poetry. People have been dialoguing with earth and nature and uh, our home, uh, you know, through language forever. Um, and some of these poets come from very different cultures, um, like uh, the haiku poetry of Basho from Japan, or um, you know, poets from the Middle East like Hafiz and Rumi, um, Khalil Gibran, uh, many others. So I want to highlight a few today, anyway. Um, and yeah. I also am just really grateful that Penn is here today with us. Um, you know, poet, uh, London's uh, premier nature poet and my friend. So thank you to Penn. And uh, yeah, we'll begin our dialogue quite shortly and we'll be dialoguing about poetry in these times and in these difficult times and in these troubling times. Um, and so with that, I just like to touch upon um, and bring into our space together uh, a couple of frameworks from this series. Um, this series has really been about strengthening our, our strengthening our resolve and strengthening our sense of well-being uh, in the context of environmental degradation and in the context of environmental engagement, because these things, impact us when we see what is happening to our world and species and places we love and what that means for our loved ones. And so, you know, my philosophy and my practice is that we can't leave um, the, the critical social engagement uh, separate from the inner world, but our inner world can be magnified and held and nourished, which can help us uh, protect us from burnout when we engage or from some of these stronger currents of emotion like fear and overwhelm and even hopelessness that people have talked about in the series. Um, so with that, I, I want to um, give a couple of frameworks that you may just review them quick that you, and this might be the first time you're seeing them um, or you've seen them before in the series or somewhere else. Um, and the frameworks and all these ideas are really meant uh, to support you and some of them might resonate uh, as in where we share ideas anywhere. Um, some of them might really resonate with you and please use them if they're helpful. And if they don't resonate with you, of course, you can just leave them in this space together. But they're meant, you know, to be helpful. They've been beneficial to me and that's why I share them. So, yeah, as we uh, think about maybe some of our concerns in this time. Um, and I wonder if, if anyone, and thank you, I, I noticed some more things about sharing in our chat there about um, bird poems from favorite authors, awesome, yeah. Warblers, other bird talk, okay, beautiful. Yeah, it's nice to use the chat um, to connect and like um, beyond beyond Zoom, right? So, or the, the functions or the limitations. So I just wanna ask, you know, at this time period, are there certain issues that, that concern you more than others, you know, looking at the living world and, and our planet. So maybe I'll open that up to the chat as well for a moment to consider because I just wanna to touch into this time period as we set the stage for what Penn and I will talk about. So feel welcome if you wanna share in the chat any issues that, that um, weigh heavy or you have concerns about. Um, there's different language kind of given to this unique time in history, you know, where 
we, the folks alive today in our long ancestral chains um, are facing some like big issues that require not just really our individual um, participation, though those individual participations in gardening and voting and civic engagement, all of those things help create trends. Those are very valuable, but it really requires system change, you know, a shift in culture. And so this time period has often been called uh, the great unraveling from folks like uh, David Corton, a, a philosopher, American philosopher, an engaged citizen. Um, and with the great unraveling and these issues, maybe some of the issues that you might be concerned of like climate change or, or you know, the war going on. With these issues comes an awakening because we can see that uh, there are threats and there are threats rising. And so if we stay awake to that and we see and we notice, it can spark in us a desire for change, a desire to participate um, along that line it can it can spark a lot of difficult feelings too and so but those feelings are bringing our, our attention and so yeah Linda's sharing you know our water especially our fresh water here in Canada it is a concern right now with water takings from corporations with pollution face of species so there are things you know that weigh on our mind but with with these challenges that we face, it is sparking a broader awareness and a great growing of social movements. We only need to think back to right before the pandemic and to see uh, you know, the human stage alit with millions of youth calling adult attention with the Fridays for Future movement, many other movements. And so I like this frame a lot because it reminds me that when I participate, you know, in my in my garden pots uh, with plants for pollinators or writing a letter or an email to an elected official that I'm part of something. And this something goes back to many generations of civic engagement, to social movements, to artists, to much more. So I want to call in the great turning of which we are all a part of uh, as we choose to be and um, talk a little bit brief about um, the different ways that we can engage in the great turning and how we're engaging it maybe even in, in it today. So of course there is the traditional that we see the activism, you know, seeing the resistance. Resistance is so important. Resisting destruction is absolutely vital and dignified. Uh, and even in our local city, we have like a very strong like resistance movement. London uh, is a city across Canada known to have strong resistance movement, the nonviolent. Uh, peace movements for change, different activists we've seen also in this series. Um, and this series, by the way, it will be posted in May on the London Public Library YouTube channel. And uh, it did feature some, some local groups like the Council of Canadians, um, some organization NGOs that are like great for networking, like London Environmental Network, the city, lots of things, and, and, and these frameworks as well, and also how to support our emotions. So if, if that interests you, they'll be posted in May on the London Public Library YouTube. But yeah, back to resisting. So that's one way that we can get involved, whether that's boycotts or protests, et cetera. We might be drawn to that, but we might be drawn to other things. Like for example, I'm creating, maybe uh, some of us here are poets, artists, healers of uh, different kinds, or we like to create our backyard in new and wonderful ways that align uh, better with nature. So creating is so important. And finally, perceiving. I really wanted to bring into this dialogue the importance of perceiving, or we can call that also like shifts in consciousness. Um, this frame is used in the tradition that Joanna mentioned that I uh, study and work in, which is the work that reconnects. And this idea that um, we need shifts in consciousness. We can't solve the complex problems that exist today with uh, the same thinking that caused them uh, from drawing from Einstein. Um, so how we perceive and, and how we can move into gratitude and, and wonder even when times are bad. Along with shifts in consciousness, you know, maybe one of the most fundamental shifts 
I put forth, you know, based on many other people and teachers that have shared this with me, that we need today is shifts to ecological consciousness, understanding and seeing that we are one in the web of life. And yeah. And so poets can do that. Poets can remind us and Penn, I know will remind us today uh, through poetry that we are in the web and we share the same consciousness as rivers, right? As rivers flow, we, we drink from the river, we drink from in London, Lake Huron and Lake Erie. And so that is in us and that becomes us. And, you know, it shapes how we think, how we treat our body, shapes how we think and, and who we connect with in our watershed, all the beings. So I invite you to ponder that thought and move into Marie Howe, another contemporary American poet. Uh, this poem here, Singularity, you may be familiar with it. There's a beautiful video on YouTube uh, through like the Marginalian blog web space. They hold events of poetry and science coming together and there's a beautiful video an animation, you could just, if you like this poem, um, type in singularity in YouTube. But talking about this, I've just pulled a snippet from this poem to contemplate our deep connection with uh, nature and that we are nature and, um, and to contemplate it in the context of these times. Singularity, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. Remember, there was no nature, no them, no test to determine if the elephant grieves her calf or if the coral reef, reef feels pain. Trashed oceans don't speak English or Farsi or French. Would that we could wake up to what we were when we were ocean? And before that, to when sky was earth and animal was energy and rock was liquid and stars were space and space was not at all nothing. Before we came to believe humans were so important, before this awful loneliness. Okay, let's talk about the power of poetry in the 21st century. Welcome to Penn Camp. Thank you. Penn, um, so I thought we would get started uh, with your poem coming in today. Mm. Um, and I love this poem. And uh, yeah, do you, do you wanna uh, start by treating us with a read of this poem, please, Penn? Yeah, I loved your reading of the Marie Howe poem as well. And this was the last performed with the choir at uh, uh, Oak Ridge Presbyterian Church. It was a great thrill. Coming into day. Where I know myself to be most true is in the garden, listening to what plants need. The Carolina wren awakens in dark before five, brash and bright as its racing stripe. This American tourist here to stay with global warming, visits the shed for possible nesting site, darts to exit fast at our approach. Outside, she turns a peel that carries across the yard, so much more piercing than you'd think that tiny flitting body would allow. Sound reverberates what tongue cannot repeat. Why is there such a gulf between ear and mouth? If only ear could descend to hear the heart and utter her plaints in trill, a tuning for resonating with dawn, even as I rise almost reluctantly and gather garden tools to work the ground, to open the heart. Thank you. 
Thank you, Penn. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, there's so much in that poem. You know, I love the piece around connecting ear to heart. Mm -hmm. do, you want, do you want to talk a little bit? I'm going to share my screen so I can see you and we yeah. can see each other a little bit better. And would you share a little bit more about like your sense, how poetry is a language of the heart and connecting us to heart? Yeah, I think it takes us back to the amniotic fluid of our mother's womb because sound is the first sense that we can experience in the womb. And sound, for me, begins a poem. So that movement from the ear to the heart. And ear is in within the word heart, of course, as is art, as is earth, if you do an anagram of it. All is revealed within that word. Um, so sound and sounding is, is what carries that which has never been articulated before into a new poem. Hmm. Neat, neat. So it's not by accident, Penn, that, that you're a sound poet because you're known also very much as a sound poet. Mm -hmm. Also listening to children, their babble as they, as they develop language and, uh, and speak in the rhythms of the language of their mother. Um, because that is what they have become accustomed to hearing. And yet, as they discover language, the every apparently, so I have read, um, a baby by the age of one years old has, or one year old, has uh, uttered every sound that it's possible for a human being to make. But by the age of five or 10 or 20 or 77, that um, vocal cord has become taut and, and tough and um, has dried up, has fried. And you can't, I can't make the uh, sounds of the calm people in the Kalahari desert for the clicks. I can't do those sounds. So the more you play as a, as a child with sound, the more, um, flexible your vocal cords will be hmm. or you can cool. play cool cool it's interesting that you bring us to children and like take us into a space right now as we're talking about nature of uh all the sounds that children make right because if we think of children and their language of sound i don't know it just kind of reminds that um we, we often think that other species maybe aren't, we're trained to think that other species aren't as intelligent as us because their language sounds so different, right? But actually our original language is just sound. Exactly. And, mm. Yeah, that was my wish as a little tiny girl was most in the world was to hear, understand what the birds were saying. And now I know it's all about mating and territory, et cetera, and joy, but it's also about joy. Your joy, especially in the spring. Oh my God, the, the peals and the sounds of the birds in my backyard. Mm. Yeah, totally, totally. The the bird song of oh, like the colorful, incredible uh, singing birds that we get in this region. Let's let's go a little bit further now, then, um, because we are going to bring in some birds uh, into into the space in our dialogue. Uh, we'll go to another poem. I'll share my screen, and then I think I'll unshare when we chat as much as possible. Okay, so connecting us to the heart, gift of poetry. And along with like connecting to the heart, I just wanna raise another point um, that poetry can also be a vehicle for uh, or really actually a container maybe for putting in difficult emotions. So if we write poetry of any style on any whim or committed practice, you know, we can put those emotions into poetry, just like artists have been putting emotions, difficult emotions in society into paintings, right? And into song. We should not uh, forget the uh, capacity of poetry to hold our various emotions. And so there's a, a poem by Khalil Gibran um, around fear. And um, I don't think actually I'll read that poem now, but we can see it on our eyes. 
um, you know, Khalil Gibran talking about fear. And uh, yeah, with our river, our view of the river. Well, let's continue with our where we're at. Pen. Um, well, the other thing about sounding is, is yeah. that it does articulate, it does bring down every emotion possible. So when words fail us, poetry can take us into sound. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to talk now a little bit about um, poetry giving voice, because so much of your work has been about poetry giving voice to the living world. So we, mm -hmm. I think um, you're going to share, um, and then maybe we can dialogue a little bit about that after. Yeah, sure. This one is called Wind Chime. And it, it takes off from the first line that you just said about giving voice to the voiceless. Winds chime. Poets give voice to the voiceless. The language we don't understand. A breeze ripples throughout all the aspen siblings down to roots. What would one giant trembling whistle? I'm sorry, I'm trying to read from the screen and from the book and they are different. So I will yeah. go back to what the book is saying. Yeah. Yeah. A breeze ripples throughout all the aspen siblings down to roots they share across a single source. Source, source, spring sings sorcery. A single tree may live a century in colonial colonies while its system of roots lasts millennia as the oldest living organism. What would one trembling giant whistle, whisper across the river to its neighboring clone? Hold on, hold fast, changing, changing, elemental mingle. In slow, shaky, sibilance, and silver leaves quake response. <laughs> Thank you, Pen. So definitely, you know, it's a great demonstration of giving voice as a poet to the voiceless, giving voice to nature. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Well, we can give voice to, if we listen. The first part of being a poet is the gift of the listening ear, of, of really listening to what's around us and then transcribing that. I mean, with the aspen, I'm using a whole lot of sibilants, the S sound, which is something I normally avoid, but the quaking aspen, aspen, and demand those S sounds, as well as a sort of rolling M that, that continues the idea of cloning across acres and acres. So it's a direct transcription that uh, a translation, and, and you know the line from Midsummer Night's Dream, the donkey says, I am translated. Well, we could translate all the trees and all the sounds that we hear, but most especially in, in spring. And this is a very magical day because it's the Walpurgis Nacht when all the plant spirits have come to life and tomorrow is May Day. So go wash your face in the first dew and uh, celebrate nature because this is its apex Beauty. in Celtic mythology. Yeah, thank you, Pen. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about um, poetry tra to translate nature or aim to translate nature. We'll go back to another poem. Okay. So, 
Um, yeah, Emily Dickinson. Uh, fans on this call of Emily Dickinson. Um, Penn, I know also that uh, Emily Dickinson has um, inspired your work in your life. Um, maybe I'll just share a short one from Emily Dickinson and we can talk a little bit about uh, how Emily Dickinson has worked her way into your heart and life. Come slowly, Eden, lips unused to thee, bashful, sip thy jasmines as the fainting bee, reaching late his flower, round her chamber hums, counts his nectars, enters, and is lost in bombs. So what I love about Emily Dickinson is not only the close attention to the particulars here of bees, but the form she gives for her little poems and how much they contain of uh, both the inner life and the outer world around her in Amherst, Massachusetts, and how the form is uh, contained and yet opened by that long dash. We all know the long dash at one o'clock from the CBC, but, but the long dash is, uh, I, I just love it as a punctuation mark because it opens up all sorts of possibilities beyond, like the period stops, the comma carries on, the semicolon sort of puts you in your place, the colon asks you to expect more, but the long dash opens the world to all sorts of different realms that she, it's like Basho and pointing to the moon. It's, it, it opens up to all sorts of different dimensions that cannot yet, be transcribed into words. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that insight from punctuation pen. Love it. Um, your next poem that I asked you to share today, it starts with uh, oh, yeah. Emily, right? So yeah. this is a poem about bees. And this next section, I want to uh, take us all into contemplating, you know, species and moving into more how poetry is, 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 apropos for these times and some of the difficult challenges with biodiversity loss. Um, so yeah, so Penn's going to share uh, that starting point of Emily Dickinson, that reverie, that lusciousness of, of Emily, and then we're going to move, we're going to transition more into, into the state of nature today. So Penn, take it away and I'll share my screen and we'll get that poem up there. It's called yeah. When Bees what to do what when bees are you. you oh, there was a terrible joke on CBC radio this morning about the only way that we've decolonized is decolonizing bees where, because the, decol the qualities of bees are failing. Not a good joke, mm -hmm. but it's sad. Yeah. So what to do when bees are few. The first three lines are taken from Emily Dickinson. And also the whole book of River Reverie, it's, it's uh, spelled reverie rather than the usual R-E-V-E-R-I-E -E -E from Emily. And she spells it reverie with a Y and so do I. It is an option. It's not a misspelling, it's an option. What to do when bees are few? To make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee, one clover and a bee, and reverie. The reverie alone will do if bees are few. Bees are sadly far fewer now, dear Emily Dickinson, but these days it will take more than reverie to save our planet, our province, our town. What is right action? What follows? Hope. 
We write protest letters to ban Roundup. We march. What to do when garden centers sell bee-friendly plants laced with hazardous insecticide levels. We search for a new nicotinoid-free nursery offering pollinator-friendly wildflowers, native old-fashioned flora, late blooming asters, brown-eyed Susan, goldenrod and wild bergamot. We are entangled in the consequence of folly and greed. Where do we take refuge? A walled garden? A riverbank? Where do we find ourselves, our freedom in the ongoing lurch between our own restoration and public offering? We bear witness, but we cannot be excused until we change the narrative, till we retrieve all the paradox of multiplicity. We learn to live with the many complexities of community, whether wild or sustained, whether municipal or country. We learn respect. We learn to listen. We learn when to be still and when to move. Reverie will no longer do, but it's a start, the necessary pause before action. And the one comment I'd make there, I know you will have more comments, is that a walled garden is a translation of the word paradise. So if you have a fenced in yard, you're living in paradise. Thanks, Penn. That was a beautiful read. Thank you so much. And yeah, we can all contemplate on our little corner as our own paradise, definitely. In this region, especially. Yeah. Uh, what stands out for me in that poem is. Um, you know, really affirming, bearing witness, bearing witness, along with the listen and along with the reverie, tuning mm -hmm. into those energies, but also bearing witness. And sometimes, um, yeah, I think it, it's good to have reminders that just being present to what's happening is part of the work and can be. And, and you know, it's the start. It's the start of the work. I think it begins with listening and with contemplation on that listening and then moving into action. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Three balancing tripod. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of the frame that I was sharing earlier around consciousness and action and resistance. Yeah. Yeah. You need the tripod because that is sustainable, that's anchored and, and um, balanced. It will stand, but you need all three. But, but it starts with, with listening and contemplation because then the action is right action rather than just action for action's sake, which, does, which our civilization is very good at and has had dire consequences, obviously. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, we're, we are going to move more into right action. We're going to move into uh, the civic component of poetry and the arts. Um, just want to acknowledge that Gwen has put uh, a quote mm -hmm. in there. Is it the Wendell Berry one? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, bringing in Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry, definitely someone bearing witness and taking action as a poet and as a as a farmer and a, and a citizen. Awesome. Okay. And I love the two words that, that oppose one another, the sacrament of holy and the desegregation, which is includes the, the root of the sacred, the sacra, the D, but your D, your, that which means tearing down in Latin. So you're moving from desegregation to what we what we must learn to do which is to appreciate as sacrament 
nature and the land. Great. Okay. Good land. Love that. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that, putting that in the chat. Um, so, yeah, so providing warning, uh, poets call out to these events, things that are happening, poetry is providing warning as well. I want to talk a little bit about uh, one of the major challenges of our times, uh, which is ecological loss, biodiversity loss. The United Nations published a very serious report, the IPBES report in 2019 of biodiversity loss. We know it. We're mammals. We can see it, right? Um, this poem comes from Mary Oliver with her concerns embedded in them around biodiversity and other beings. Small bodies. It is almost summer. In the pond, the pickerel leap and the delicate teal have brought forth their many charming young and the turtle is ravenous. It is hard sometimes, oh Lord, to be faithful. I am more boldly made than the little ducks paddling and laughing, but not so bold as the turtle with its greasy mouth. I know you know everything. I rely on this. Still, there are so many bodies in the world for which I am afraid. Pen, can you share turtles, turtles? All the oh, way for sure. Yes, this is in honor of the spiny soft shell. And I have to, uh, I have to acknowledge the title. Uh, philosopher William James, Henry James's older brother, gave a lecture, and he, as he finished his lecture, the little old lady who had been sitting in the front row knitting furiously all the way through came up to him and said about the cosmos you're right it is turtles 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 all the way down i just love that and it reminds me of the cosmology of uh, Turtle Island, where where in the Hopi, and there are there we are based on one turtle upon another upon another upon another, and uh, so hence this poem. <laughs> oh dear, lost the page. I shall return. Sure. We are waiting turtle to arrive. She's taking her own sweet time. But her pace is steady, her approach sure. The earth gives way under her tread, each clawed foot lifting firmly, set through the clinging chaos of mud. All too many ways of endangering a, spirit, a species, given global warming. Lately, 6,000 babies incubated were freed in secret spots along the river to protect them from poachers. Without this breeding program, the species would be completely lost. Remarks, an at-risk assistant with the Upper Thames Conservation Authority. There's much more of that poem, but I think that's what you would like me to read. Is that right? Yeah, that's great, Penn. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I thank you also for putting into that poem um, the solutions, right? When, we, when we, we, we think of the different species that we care about and how they're harmed, often in the news reporting, uh, which is most of our environmental education, you know, we don't hear about those solutions. So you know, weaving that into the story is so important because there's so many people also working and attempting and the more we know the solutions, the more we feel the sense of engagement. And that is a beautiful poem describing the turtle. And yeah, there's much more to that poem in, in River Reverie, the giving birth to turtle babies, et cetera. And 
yeah, 2019 Penn's book there. Um, and yeah, so some of our, our deer species that are, are struggling are definitely that spiny soft shell. And I think um, mm -hmm. when I hear about the program that's been happening for over 25 years by the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority, that they have been uh, bringing thousands of hatchlings back into the Thames to protect them. It really gives me heart and uh, makes me feel good. Um, but the turtles still struggle, right? And especially with climate change. Um, and so. roads and roads. I love those turtle crossings, but still so many of them are trying to get across a marsh by the road. Don't make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pen, can we talk a little bit more about uh, the civic role of poetry? Um, you know, when people think of poetry in our culture, they don't often think about poets um, kind of helping to guide civic life. And I know that you were London's first poet laureate. Can you explain, like, cause there's this long history and tradition of poet laureates, of poet laureates of whole nations, poet laureates of municipalities. Can you just briefly touch on like, what is the purpose of a poet laureate? Um, and if you want to say anything about that, what yeah, you did. For sure. Um, it goes back to what you were saying earlier about poets being able to, or poems being able to express the whole range of emotion and poems have been used for occasions that uh, are beyond the ordinary. If you think of funerals there's or uh, veterans days, we have, um, we always have the or weddings. There is always a poem to mark the occasion because the poem lifts us into um, a realm and a space beyond the ordinary, out of the ordinary. So it can move the heart in ways that are on formal occasions when when, um, as in birth and death and marriage and, and celebrating our veterans, uh, armistice and so on, they, they celebrate the occasion. And so I've often, as Poet Laureate and in other um, ways, I've been asked to celebrate various civic occasions to mark the occasion with a poem. Um, which brings it, its significance out of uh, the normal realm of thinking. It's transporting. I think that's the, um, the vehicle of poetry is to transport, <laughs> not the freedom ride, but it is another way to freedom uh, or to, to go beyond um, normal perceptions, normal, normal ways of thinking to elevate perhaps, mm -hmm. yeah. Because you're going into a more spacious field than normal thought provides. Mm -hmm. It's not linear, it's not logical, it's beyond. It mm -hmm. incorporates the sacred and the magical and the, uh, the sense of pomp and circumstance, the sense of uh, yeah. occasion. Yeah, so well, thank a, you for that description. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, Along with what you're describing, I, I want to say like it it brings the our our inner lives and what we feel and what is of value into the public realm and, and gives a space for that and definitely in celebration as you described. But and, also and it's a way of uh, of of belonging to a larger community. Mm -hmm. it, in the way that song and music does it, it brings us into say the right brain we don't I don't know but the it brings us from the singular say grieving say the the singular grief into a collective acknowledgement and therefore with that collectivity with that collective uh, feeling then we can move into right action yeah, yeah. which is 
brings us to your most recent book, Poems in Response to Peril around mm -hmm. Ukraine and the war. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, it, uh, on, uh, I have been writing poems, uh, very personal poems for my husband who had just died. And then I got, on February 24th, I got a message from somewhere in spirit and to stop that and to channel my grief into the collective with Ukraine. So I asked a few poets to, uh, I just put out a general call for poets to write what uh, they would like to about Ukraine. And partly that was in response to a publisher in Kiev that were, had asked for words of encouragement and courage and um, hope for Canadian poets to write um, to Ukraine. So that was first going to be a blog post on my uh, wordpress.com, but I got so much response that we, uh, it, it developed into a chapbook and then it became a anthology that I've edited along with uh, Richard E. Satoski, the poet laureate of Owen Sound. And it is now out in the world. We are launching it at Blackfriars Bistro on Blackfriars on May 28th at 2 p.m. And all are welcome. We'll, uh, some of the lo local poets will be reading from the anthology and it's available for sale. We've already sold out our first edition, which was in uh, 300. Uh, so we've sold 300 copies. Um, and what uh, we also did is organize a Zoom call on April 2nd that uh, had 100 participants. And uh, there are 48 poets that are in the anthology across Canada. And, um, uh, also two translations of a Ukrainian poet. And then also we asked poets, Canadian or Turkish or whatever, uh, Ukrainian, to, to read their poems and send videos to uh, us. And that is on um, a, a YouTube site called Poets in response to peril, whereas the anthology is called Poems in Response to Peril. So it's it, it all came from the line from Auden, does poetry matter? Does poetry make things happen? That was my initial question. And um, so the answer is all up on pencamp at wordpress.com. Really? And in the, in the poems, um, there are 65 poems in this book. The book is 125 pages long and it's $25. Great, thank you. And we'll we'll put something in the chat about that today. Thank you, Penn, for sharing uh -huh. uh -huh. an aspect of engagement with the war from poets. Um, let's turn to climate change, Penn. I know that some of your work references climate change. Um, and so I asked you to share today. Um, just a second, my my screen isn't sharing properly. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. Page is set on. Do you have that page? I've lost. Um, I can read what's just here. I do. Oh, it's right here. Page 90. Page 90 studies in extreme. So yeah, it was written a couple of years ago, but unfortunately it may just be true. Um, and it was that that image of the Orca mother carrying her dead calf for months and months that was so touching. Mm -hmm. Studies in extreme. A summer of fire versus water, trees and seas crying aloud, and Arca Mother drops her dead calf. Attribution science lets us know that improbable events are twice as likely given human influence. The signal of human intervention, exasperated by rising temperature, risks are up even at local levels. 
while Sowesto is inundated in thunderstorms and rivers are high, forests are flaming north and west. People may feel burnt out because the future feels distant, but we are already affected. This exceptional hot summer will become the norm unless we act on working solutions now. Climate change is changing us. Hmm. Thank you, Pen, for that read. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of the time. There's a lot to talk about in this poem, but I'm aware of the time. And so we're going to continue. I just want to highlight, you know, your, your closing. Uh, the climate change is changing us. I think the poem says it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And we must just be alert to what we can do. Mm -hmm which there's a lot of movement we can do around climate change. As a climate crisis educator and teacher trainer, there's, we spend a lot of time uh, looking at civil society in our courses uh, that we run. And there's so many ways to engage with civil society and there's great science out there. The science is clear. Um, and so going to a global perspective on climate change, thank you for giving the local perspective and the image that many of us saw with the orca mother. Um, I want to turn to an important um, poem performance at the 2014 UN Climate Summit by a poet from the Marshall Islands, Kathy Jetnil Kitchener. And you can see Kathy here with her partner, her husband, and uh, her baby, who this poem is written to. So I'm going to play uh, Kathy's thoughts around uh, the climate crisis and her child in the future as uh, a voice of island nations that are, you know, very threatened by flood and uh, really endangered uh, if we don't stick to policy that limits climate change to a 1.5 degrees change. If we don't draw in uh, carbon from the atmosphere by protecting our forests in other ways we don't stop the production of new fossil fuel projects. Okay, let's go over to Kathy. Dear Matafele Benu, you are a seven month old sunrise of gummy smiles. You are bald as an egg and bald as the Buddha. Your thighs that are thunder, shrieks that are lightning, so excited for bananas, hugs, and our morning walks along the lagoon. Dear Matafelebinum, I want to tell you about that lagoon, that lucid, sleepy lagoon lounging against the sunrise. Men say that one day, that lagoon will devour you. They say it will gnaw at the shoreline, chew at the roots of your breadfruit trees, gulp down rows of your sea walls, and crunch through your island's shattered bones. They say you, your daughter, and your granddaughter too, will wander rootless with only a passport to call home. Dear Mata Filipina, don't cry. Mommy promises you, no one will come and devour you. No greedy whale of a company sharking through political seas. No backwater bullying of businesses with broken morals. No blindfolded bureaucracies gonna push this mother ocean over the edge. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's gonna become a climate change refugee. Or should I say, no one else. To the Carteret Islanders of Papua New Guinea and to the Taro Islanders of Fiji, I take this moment to apologize to you. We are drawing the line here. Because baby, we are going to fight. Your mommy, daddy, boo boo, dima, your country, and your president too, we will all fight. And even though there are those hidden behind platinum titles who like to pretend that we don't exist, that the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, Kiribati, Maldives, and Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines and floods of Pakistan, Algeria, and Colombia, and hurricanes, tidal waves, and earthquakes didn't exist, still, there are those who see us. Hands reaching out, 
fists raising up, banners unfurling, megaphones booming, and we are canoes blocking coal ships. We are the radiance of solar villages. We are the rich, clean soil of the farmer's past. We are petitions blooming from teenage fingertips. We are families biking, recycling, reusing, engineers dreaming, designing, building, artists, painting, dancing, writing. We are spreading the word. And there are thousands out on the street, marching with signs, hand in hand, chanting for change now. They're marching for you, baby. They're marching for us. Because we deserve to do more than just survive. We deserve to thrive. Dear Mata Filipino, you were eyes heavy with drowsy weight. So just close those eyes, baby, and sleep in peace. Because we won't let you down. You'll see. So as Canadians, you know, uh, what her work and when I hear the stories of the Marshall Islands, when I know what's going on in the Philippines, when I know what's happening in Bangladesh, these stories can remind us and give us great inspiration for the babies, the generations coming to act for system change. In London locally, for example, we have the London Climate Emergency Action Plan, which was embraced by all of city council. Um, and people can sign on and pledge their commitment to that. And we can push forth conversations on the need to transition off of fossil fuels to hold the carbon budget at a balance. Uh, to protect life. So I want to give my gratitude to this Marshall Islands poet. And I think in solidarity on behalf of many uh, folks in the global south and poetry can help guide us there. And so can our own voices and our own actions in so many ways. So we've talked about a lot of things today that uh, poetry can do. Poetry can cultivate wonder, gratitude, healing, and also be a container for difficult emotions or bringing, as Ben said, various like true felt emotions into public and honoring, uh, you know, life in our communities. It can awaken the heart. It can give voice to the voiceless, uh, translate nature, it can warn in necessary times. We need warning and we need to heed these warnings now can shape society. Also, poetry can offer us affirmation and celebration. And we want to end before a little bit of a question and answer time. If you have any questions coming up um, in your mind, we want to end on affirmation and celebration. So calling back in those uh, species that we love or earth that we love or just life that we love into this conversation. And uh, Alice Walker has a great kind of blessing type of poem or around that or a blessing text really it comes from the gospel according to Shug in the book the temple of my familiar Alice says in the voice of Shug helped are those who love the earth their mother and who willingly will suffer that she may not die in their grief over her pain they will reap, weep rivers and in their joy in her lively response to love they will converse with the trees and the aspens that Penn drew our attention to earlier in her conversation with the trees. Alice also says, helped are those who, whose every act is a prayer for harmony in the universe, for they are the restorers of balance to our planet. To them will be given the insight that every good act done anywhere in the cosmos welcomes the life of an animal or a child. I love this piece because it reminds me that the little things that I do can welcome life. Penn, you have a beautiful poem that's a blessing um, called Surprised by Joy. Will you do a final reading for us today? Yes, for sure. And it is so essential to be inspired by joy, the carrot of joy rather than the stick of uh, duty. It, um, our impulse is is towards towards joy. So this is a blessing poem as well. All surprised by joy.
which is a, a line, a title of a book by uh, C.S. Lewis. But Joy was his wife's name. He was surprised by her. Surprised by Joy. Blessed be here. Blessed be clever cardinals who vary their song into language only other cardinals Blessed be squirrels who scold all intruders into submission. Blessed be hostas and fern mixing wild with cultivated. Blessed be composted soil that allows for splendid fluorescence. Blessed be standing waves over the shore. Blessed be silent wing of crow, and when it lands on a spruce branch, that raucous call. Blessed be the interchange of story, space to be alone, together. Blessed be silence. Blessed be the daily, the expanse of time. Blessed be the dream. Blessed be night that covers the shore in a moiré spread. Blessed be the bare black cherry, dead in winter's past blast, but ready to turn into fire's best wood, slow burning, hot. Blessed be the fisher whose refrain runs through a still too busy brain, still listening, listening to the river's flow. Carp leap and fall, circling in stream. Like calls to like through the brightening air. Thank you, and thank you for having me here, Jen. It's uh, uh, on this gorgeous day. We're all going to go out for a walk afterwards, but this has been a, a, just a very dear experience and uh, a sharing of community through poetry. I love it. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much mm -hmm. for all, all the words and the many years of, of this sharing you've been doing. Mm -hmm. I want to give everybody a chance to... Um, just reflect on their own blessing with poetry um, and we'll invite people now to take just a moment for yourself in your own space there to write a blessing for species that you care for you can use uh, pens pens entry you know the first few lines and speak back to that on your own page uh, you can start with blessed be the whatever comes to mind blessed be that mischievous squirrel outside my window on the tree bark blessed be the bark rising to the blue expanse of sky whatever comes to mind in your own voice or you can use blessed be or something else but let's just take a couple moments to tune in to ourselves and do just a couple minutes of writing. Let me see, 224, it'll be very brief. In fact, it'll be maybe two minutes just to touch down on page. And then um, if anybody wants to share a, a golden line in the chat, a line that you like, feel very welcome to do that. We'll be wrapping up in about three minutes. I'm gonna get out my pencil and see what falls off the end of it. And I can see people sharing in chat. Juno says, blessed be the turtle and heron sharing the same branch this morning. 
Uh, Jesse says, um, blessed be to the warmth of the sunshine. Indeed, what a gorgeous day and time we are in. All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll close with a, a few last thoughts. Um, and uh, yeah, big thanks back to you, Penn, for today. And look forward to see seeing what many new books are coming out of uh, your hands. I know you've got a lot on the go. We'll make a couple announcements around that. And yeah, there's more blessings in the chat. You're welcome to enter more of those. I will share my screen and uh, we'll close together. Oh, this would be okay. So maybe in fact, um, we'll do a couple announcements, Joanna, and then we might have time for a question or two at the end. So um, yeah, I just want to remind you of Penn's work that she shared today. There's so much work, but there's River Reverie. Uh, that has been put in the chat where you can purchase that. I know it's on Amazon as well. If you want to participate in River Reverie, there is a website about this book with um, a lot of animation and there is a community board. You can add your thoughts on the Thames River there. I just put the website on there for you and it's coming in the chat if it hasn't come yet, riverreverie.ca. Also, there's Penn's book, Poets in Response to Peril. And Joanna, do you, can you make a few announcements on behalf of City Action? Yes, thank you, Jennifer. Um, yeah, let me just share an event that's coming up. Uh, so it's coming up this Thursday in Wolf Performance Hall. And it is London's first uh, mi bird migration festival. Let me just give you a few details and I'll put a link in the chat, but um, it's happening, as I said, at Wolf Performance Hall in the Central Library. It's a partnership between the library, Nature London and Bird Friendly London. So the kickoff is Thursday evening and uh, the weekend has many more events as well, which you'll see from the link, but we're very excited about it. Doors open at 630 and we'll have great speakers on all kinds of birdie topics. And uh, here is the link in the chat for you to check that out. And I think we have one more announcement. That we do, let me get to that. Thank you for sharing the bird festival. Great. And, um, as you know, this is a partnership with the City of London as well. So I just want to share one other thing from them. So first of all, it's the um, Climate Emergency Action Plan, which was unanimous, unanimously approved by City Council last month. Uh, it was developed during the pandemic. Um, and so the city is, is aware that due to necessity, community engagement was primarily focused on electronic communication and virtual engagement. To respond to this limitation, one of the 10 work plans that is part of the uh, Climate Emergency Action Plan is titled Engaging, Inspiring, and Learning from People, which aims to widen engagement, including London's arts and literary community who can take an active part in supporting the literacy, knowledge, and content on climate change. So again, we'll put a link in the chat about getting involved there. And um, I'll put it in there and you can uh, take a look at more, more there, but that's, that's all I have, Jennifer. Thank you very much for those announcements, great. Um, thank you to everyone for your participation today. Beautiful blessings in the chat. So awesome. I wanna let you know about the last session in this series, it's Eco-Activism for Youth with Water Protector Basie Gray from Angelong First Nation. It is next Saturday from one to 4 p.m. If you know any young people who uh, are among uh, the groups of young people around the world that are concerned about climate change, concerned about what's happening to the earth and are feeling alone. A lot of the studies are showing they're feeling alone and abandoned by the adult world. Please get in touch with me, get in touch with the library. Please share this event with them. It's meant in adult solidarity with young people holding a space. Daisy is very inspiring. So that is our last event. Um, and thank you everybody for being part of this series today and, and longer, some of you. And um, just remember, we are all in this together. 
and um, Emily Dickinson should get the last words, I think. In the name of the bee and of the butterfly and of the breeze, amen. We are at 2.30 now, so um, I don't know if you had questions. Um, we want to give this space, you know, to close on time. So maybe, Penn, do you have like five minutes to stick around for anyone who sticks around for the little extra portion for a question? Would that, would that be good? And yep. And uh, yeah, but otherwise we say goodbye to everybody and um, have a beautiful day. And as, pa as Penn said, let's uh, launch ourselves into May Day and the raucous rising of birds and plants and everybody. And out for a walk by the Thames or the Red River or wherever you are, the Avon for those in St. Mary's. Absolutely. So, What's the river by you, Patrick? Yeah.